Hi, fellas. I'm really glad to see you again. You know, with this meeting, we're starting off our 15th year of Master Tech. Gosh, seems like just yesterday we kicked off this program. Congratulations, Tech. A lot of goods come out of these sessions. But uh, what brings you back with us again this month? Well, I'll tell you. Since you just got back from a session at the training center, you're just the pair to handle diagnosis on some of the electrical units. Sounds fine to me. Let's start with the alternator. Good idea. We'll assume it failed its output test on the car, and we'll make further tests on the bench. You remove it while Frank gets the test equipment together. Okay, Tech. I'll get a fully charged battery, a test ammeter, and a jumper, and we can get to work. I'll have the alternator off in a jiffy, Tech. Now be sure and disconnect the battery ground cable first. That way you won't accidentally short-circuit the alternator leads. The test equipment's all set, Tech. Fine. As soon as Hal gets over here with the alternator, we'll start off with a rotor coil field current draw test. Here's your alternator, Tech. Want me to set up the test connections? Sure. You do the connecting, and I'll start the explaining. Connect the test ammeter in series between the positive post of the battery and the alternator field terminal. Then, connect the jumper between the battery negative post and the machined surface of the alternator end shields. Okay, Tech. I'm right with you. Fine. Now, turn the rotor manually by rotating the pulley. That'll give you a check on how well the brushes follow the slip rings when the rotor's turning. If the reading's below 2.3 amperes, there's either high resistance in the field windings or between the brushes and slip rings. And if the reading is over 2.8 amperes, the field windings are shorted. That's right, Hal. What test do you suggest next, Tech? Let's test the internal field circuit for accidental grounding. But first, remove the ground brush from the alternator. Then... Connect a 110-volt test lamp into an outlet. Touch one test lamp prod to the field terminal of the alternator and the other prod to a machine surface on one of the end shields. The lamp should not light. However, if the test lamp lights, there's an accidental ground in the circuit and additional tests have to be made to locate it, right? Key wreck it, Frank. To do this, remove the insulated brush and its plastic holder. Then, take out the three bolts. I'll remove the rectifier end shield from the drive end shield and rotor so we can continue our testing. Now, hold one of the test lamp prods on one of the slip rings. Touch the other prod on the end of the shaft. The lamp should not light. But if it does light, that means the rotor is grounded. That's right, Hal. But if the lamp doesn't light, the ground is in the insulated brush assembly. Someone may have damaged the brush holder by prying against it. In addition, if the parts are not assembled in the proper order, they could cause a short circuit. So be sure they are assembled in the sequence shown in this picture. That's a very important point, Tech. What else have you got to offer? While the alternator is partially disassembled, it's a good idea to inspect all parts of the unit, especially the rotor slip rings. That's right, Tech. Always look for traces of oil or grease on the rings, as well as a burned or worn condition. Light scratches or marks can usually be removed with double aught sandpaper, but do it carefully. I suppose if they're too badly damaged, you'd have to replace them. That's right. Also, examine the brushes for signs of sticking in their holders, and for wear. Early built alternators use square brushes, but the round ones they now use in production and service are less likely to stick. Solder connections must be good. The rectifier leads and capacitor must be cemented to the end shield. This prevents vibration and keeps them out of the way of the rotor blades. Hit and miss methods just won't work. It's close attention to details that results in a good job. Glad to see that you've got that firmly fixed in your mind. Now, let's get on with the job of testing the diode rectifiers. Okay, I'll take it from here, Tech. If the alternator output was slightly under specs, that is, five to seven amps low, it could mean one of the rectifiers has an open circuit. And if the output was excessively low, it would usually mean there's a shorted rectifier. You fellas have that down pat. 
We know what we're looking for, so we can use this tester to find it. With this new tester, you don't have to open the Y connection to test the rectifiers. That's right, Al. It sure saves time. Frank will give you a hand testing those rectifiers. Well, first, plug the tester into a 110-volt outlet. Then, connect the alligator terminal to the bat terminal on the alternator. Touch the test prod to the rectifier leads of each of the positive rectifiers in the heat sink. Be sure to test at the connection nearest the rectifier. The meter reading should be 1.7 amperes or more, and the same for each rectifier. Now, if two rectifiers show almost identical readings, but they are lower than 1.7 amperes, and the third rectifier has a zero reading, you can be sure this last one is shorted. And if you take the shorted rectifier out of the circuit by cutting the lead, the readings on the other two rectifiers will go up to normal. Say, there's still another set of readings that we've got to take. I'll take it for you, Frank. If two rectifiers show normal readings, and the third one has a reading of one ampere or less, more than likely this last one has an open circuit. Well, that's about all there is to testing the positive rectifiers. Right you are, Tech. Now, to test the negative rectifiers, move the alligator clip from the bat terminal to a good ground on the shield. Then, touch the test prod to the bare wire of the rectifier leads, the same as you did on the positive rectifiers. Test specifications are the same, but meter readings will be on the opposite end of the scale. Quite often, the cause of shorted rectifiers is reversed battery polarity. A faulty alternator capacitor will also short out rectifiers. And just remember, a service technician doesn't have to be an expert electrician to test out an alternator. With the proper equipment, he can do a good job of servicing it, if he'll only follow proper procedures. Take over, Frank. Well, Tech, before we get into installing new rectifiers, I'd like to cover some other tests. Hold it, Frank. We've just about run out of record, so let's turn it before you do any more testing. Now let's get back to our testing. We'll start with the stator coils. These are insulated from the laminated core. A break in the insulation, allowing the bare wire to touch the core, would cause a short circuit in the stator and result in no output or burned windings. First, lift the stator away from the end shield and insulate the two units from each other with thin pieces of wood. And be careful you don't break those leads from the coils. Use this 110-volt test lamp. Touch one prod to an uncoated surface of the core and the other prod to one of the rectifier leads. Make sure you have a good electrical contact at both prods. The lamp should not light. But if the test lamp lights, there's a ground in the coil windings to the core and the stator must be replaced. That's an obvious but excellent deduction, Hal. Remember, I mentioned that a faulty capacitor could short out a rectifier. Well, here's how we test the capacitor. You'll notice this capacitor is internally mounted. Some of the earlier alternators have externally mounted capacitors. Remove the ground screw and then move the capacitor lead away from the shield. Connect one lead of the tester to the alternator bat terminal and the other to the disconnected capacitor lead. And be sure you don't touch either clip to the end shield or the rectifier leads, or it'll short out the rectifiers. On this capacitor, the minimum reading is 0.158 microfarad. On the externally mounted capacitor, the minimum is 0.5 microfarad. Capacitors that don't test within these specs should be replaced. That test is clear enough. I suppose we're ready now to cover removing and replacing rectifiers, huh? Right. You can begin by explaining where to cut the rectifier lead. Cut off the end of the connector that is crimped to the rectifier lead. Be sure and leave enough of the connector to ensure a good mechanical connection for the new rectifier lead. Those are words of wisdom, Hal. Now, let's get on with the removing and installing of rectifiers. You've got to press the old rectifiers out. If you ever try to drive them out, sure as rain, you'll ruin the heat sink or the end shield, and then you're in trouble. Next, 
Support the rectifier end shield on this tool so the bore completely surrounds the rectifier. Notice the tool is slotted to fit over the wires. Then, use this removing tool, which is slightly less in diameter than the rectifier, to press out the old rectifier. Comes out slick as a whistle, Frank. If you had to remove all the rectifiers, wouldn't it be more convenient to cut each of the rectifier leads and remove the stator from the shield? Yes, it would, Hal. But it's seldom necessary to replace more than one or two rectifiers. Use common sense and the proper tools to install rectifiers. Never drive. Always press in new rectifiers. Anybody that doesn't believe this is sure to break the shield or heat sink and damage the rectifier as well. Rectifiers with red markings are positive rectifiers and should be installed only in the heat sink, right? That's right. And the ones with the black markings are the negative rectifiers. They are pressed into the end shield. To install a rectifier, first support the heat sink or end shield on this support tool. Start the rectifier straight in its bore. Then press the rectifier in place with this installer. Be sure you use the modified installer with a .515 bore to avoid damaging the rectifier. Uh, just a word of caution. When installing a rectifier, press until you feel it's seated properly. Don't try to press it through the sink or the shield. This about brings us up to the soldering operation, doesn't it? Yes, but before you solder, clean the rectifier lead and connector. Even a small amount of foreign matter will prevent you from making a good solder connection. Then, wrap the end of the rectifier lead tightly around the connector. Hold the lead firmly with long nose pliers. They will absorb the heat while soldering and protect the rectifier. Use only rosin core solder. Be sure the lead and terminal are hot enough to flow the solder into the connection. You can tell a good soldering job by the solder. And don't remove the pliers until the connection cools. After the solder is cooled, push the leads down out of the way of the rotor blades. Cement the leads to the end shield with this special non-conductive alternator cement. Uh, just one last tip on the alternator. Always test newly installed rectifiers before you reassemble the alternator. That's mighty good insurance against comebacks. Now, are you ready to hear what we learned about the new Chrysler-built cranking motor tech? Well, there isn't time enough to cover all the details of servicing this new gear reduction cranking motor. Why don't you and Hal cover the most important service precautions and the bench tests? Good idea, Tech. There are some mighty important do's and don'ts on this new cranking motor. For one thing, the housing is made of aluminum. Don't clamp it in a vise. It's all right to use the vise as a motor holding fixture if you use a set of soft jaws. But remember, don't clamp it in. Another thing... The armature commutator and brushes are located in the center of the motor. That means the field frame has to be removed before the brushes can be serviced. To do this, take out the two through bolts and then slip off the end head assembly. Lift the armature out of the field coils. Notice that there's a steel and a fiber washer on the outer end of the armature and a fiber washer at the commutator end. These washers have to be put back in the same order. Another tip, before lifting off the field frame, place two one-inch wooden blocks between the frame and housing 180 degrees apart. Then, unsolder the connection where the shunt field coil lead and the solenoid coil wire are jointed to the contact terminal post. If you forget to unsolder those wires, you'll tear them out by the roots. The series field to brush attaching screw should come out next. Look the brushes over, and if they're worn down to one quarter inch or less, they should be replaced. Oil soak brushes should be replaced too. After you remove the solenoid, inspect the solenoid contact disc for burned spots. If the disc is only slightly burned, it can still be used by removing it from the plunger rod and turning it over. Another thing. The brush terminal post and small switch contact are serviced as an assembly. If the contact is burned or loose, it'll cause a drop in voltage. It can't be tightened. 
you'll only succeed in cracking the plastic brush holder. So replace the assembly. There's also a voltage drop possibility in the solenoid hold-in winding ground circuit. This circuit is through the solenoid coil, the sleeve, the two retainers, and pinion and gear housing. All surfaces have to be clean and free from corrosion and assembled properly. This compression type retainer holds these parts tightly together. Compression is provided by the preset of the retainer tangs. Be sure and follow the procedure in the reference book when setting up the compression on these parts. Hal, I believe there are a few precautions you should mention regarding the cleaning of cranking motor parts. Yes, there are, Tech. Never under any circumstances dip the field frame and coil assembly or the armature in cleaning solution. This will damage the coils. Right. And the same goes for the clutch drive. The lubricant in this assembly will be diluted and washed out. Just use a clean cloth to wipe off the parts. How about armature and field coil tests? To test the armature for shorts, you use a growler and a thin steel blade. A short in the armature will cause the blade to vibrate as it's attracted to the core. You can test the armature for a ground with a 110 volt test lamp, the same as on the former type armature. If the lamp lights, it indicates a grounded armature. Test the field coils for grounding with a 110 volt test lamp, but be sure you remove the ground rivet first. That's right, Frank, and here's a tip. Install the ground rivet with a head on the inside so you can support it on a pipe or drift and peen the other end. Use these four brush retaining tools when you install the armature. They hold the brushes back so they don't get damaged when the armature is being installed. That's right, Hal. These assembly details, plus a lot more information on the servicing of cranking motors, alternators, and voltage regulators will be found in the reference book. Frank and Hal and I have given you the highlights in the servicing of alternators and cranking motors, and we've just about run out of time. Your know-how on electrical servicing can pay dividends in customer confidence and satisfaction. That's important to all of us. I'll see you all again next month. <laughs>